Hey everybody, I am here with Adam Green of No More, no More News, and uh, we're going to basically talk about how uh, ignoring what's going on overseas has a nasty tendency to bring it home to roost. So um, today, as you probably know, is the Israeli elections. Um, we get to see whether Bibi gets his uh, kingship that he's always wanted or whether it will get the other psycho. And um, basically uh, Netanyahu has declared that he's going to annex the West Bank if he gets elected and Trump, of course, will back him the entire way. Now we've seen some pushback as far as uh, this new defining anti-Semitism to basically include uh, all criticism of Israel and uh, even from complete milk toasts like uh, Ted Lieu, this uh, senator or, rep or representative um, from California who's basically called out uh, our ambassador David Friedman for dual loyalty and then of course immediately apologized for that. Would you say that uh, if even people like Ted Lieu are calling out the uh, quote unquote dual loyalty of our people who are supposed to be serving America and are actually serving Israel, that we're making progress or that uh, this is just a sign of an impending like even tighter crackdown on what we're allowed to say? Yeah, I did a video uh, on the Ted Lieu uh, apology that I think it was the ADL and the Zionist Organization of America were forcing him to apologize, or maybe it was just one or the other, but he said that David Friedman, the ambassador, had dual loyalty, which he absolutely does. Uh, he also said uh, allegiance to a foreign power, which he absolutely does. And uh, they forced him to apologize. And, and it also, it kind of reminds me of the New York Times, the Schultzberger editor there. They ran the cartoon with Netanyahu as the guide dog for the blind Trump. And they, it's like they put a little something out there and then everybody uh, like attacks them and says, this is what's not acceptable so that nobody else will like stick their head up and like get out of line. And uh, it kind of sets the precedent of what is allowed. Yeah, so that's they, the effect they're having. So they put it out in just like manageable bits, and then those bits can be shot down, and everybody mimics that behavior, and then just cowers uh, obediently. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, yeah, they're trying to make it really clear that you can't talk about dual loyalty. It's already the definition of anti-Semitism at state.gov, in the same language that's been in bills, and that they're. They've got petitions to try to uh, get the media, the mainstream media, to adopt this definition of anti-Semitism. And the idea that, that uh, Friedman or Kushner or all of these you know, people involved with APEC and Trump's administration, that they don't have huge allegiance and interest for a foreign power, I mean, it's just, it's obvious. So the fact they're trying to suppress it is extremely dangerous. Yeah, I thought that um, this this idea that um, that this is oh this the it's the International Holocaust Remembrance Association that came up with this definition, and so they're trying to make it like it's the entire world that's adopted this. I saw recently somebody questioned, okay, well, how many company, uh, how many countries rather have actually adopted this definition, and they admitted it was only eight. Now, so it's not very international, is it? And I I, I just watched this documentary Witch Hunt about what's going on in Britain with uh, Jeremy Corbyn and this uh, complete sh shredding of what's left of the Labour Party's integrity as far as uh, just weaponizing this anti-Semitism thing, using it to bludgeon everybody who's pro-Palestinian to death. And uh, yeah, just like, how, what is the, this, the apology, that, that the fact that Jeremy Corbyn has spent the last three years apologizing for basically something that doesn't require apologizing, I think his name will go down in history as a synonym for uh, apologizing to a bully in such a way that the bully not only targets you, but targets all your friends. I mean, do you see that anybody's learning their lesson from this, that maybe they won't just apologize for things that don't need apologizing for? I noticed, I watched your interview with David Icke, which I thought was really good, and uh, that he is very uh, strong in favor of if you actually mean what you say and if you have facts to back it up, why would you apologize? And why are all these politicians making that same mistake, falling into this hole? They just, some people succumb to the mob. And I, I've been seeing this theme a lot recently that it, you really can't capitulate and apolo make apologies when you're in the right. And um, yeah, it, uh, who was it that just apologized recently too? And they started going after him even, oh, the Pootie Pie thing that, that comes to mind also, oh, yeah. how he was gonna give the ADL 50,000 
and then uh, and then brought it back after everybody was complaining. It gave me idea actually. I was going to keep this private, but you, 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 well, I'll talk it out with you. What if I did a video where I'm like, I'm donating a hundred million or or six million or a hundred thousand to the ADL? <laughs> six million. And I made a video, and then I decided, oh, actually, the ADL is awful. I'm not going to do that. And then I kind of explain why. I mean, I don't know if it would really work for you because your audience kind of knows what's up. PewDiePie, I think it had a really big effect because maybe not all of his audience is aware of what other scumbags these ADL are. I mean, they really should drop the anti from their name. Everybody knows, at least I think our audiences will know that they're basically a defamation league that was formed to defend a uh, rapist slash murderer and have been from the very beginning using Jewish people as a human shield behind which they can do their crimes. And then when any sort of backlash comes, they can just say, oh, how dare you say that about Jews? And the vast majority of Jews are like, wait, what? What are you, what are you talking about? But they're not, they're not gonna say anything because they've been double brainwashed, both, both from the American angle and from the, oh, you can't say anything bad about Israel. You're betraying your people. When most, I mean, fortunately, I, I've seen figures at least indicating that uh, the younger generation of Jews is not interested in this, uh, this whole, Israel, Zionist, uh, um, let's kill all the Palestinians thing. Of course, you can't even say the J word on YouTube or your video gets demonetized, but I've never had monetization from my video anyway, so I'm safe. Say but, Ticoms all you want though. Yeah, yeah, of course, because that's, that's, who that's who's behind the Epstein thing. But, but I find it interesting because it, that, isn't that very anti-Semitic of YouTube to assume that anybody talking about Jews is doing so in a negative light? I mean, that seems to me like they're the ones who are being anti-Semitic here. Well, the AI algorithms have taken down some people that were like, you know, pro-Zionist and then for some, like they used a clip or they were just had a title and then they get taken down even though they're actually like on the side of Zionism. But um, the, the Al Jazeera lobby documentary, it had some undercover footage where uh, high level uh, lobbyists for Israel were like, we're losing the young people, you know, they're, they're, uh, they, they're not marrying, they're not following uh, the traditions and stuff. So they definitely are concerned about that. They're also worried about the anti-Semitism label losing its power as well. And, and that's why we can't apologize and capitulate because they always come after you more if you do that. They feel, uh, they sense like blood in the water and then really try to capitalize uh, on the apology. And uh, the way they're trying to set stuff up, stuff up is like any mention of, you know, billionaires that obviously have tons of influence, like Rothschild or Soros or Adelson. It's like if they're Jewish, you cannot criticize them for anything. Otherwise, it's anti-Semitism. And it's it, to me and to so many other people that I know, it's so blatantly obvious. But it's just like. The ADL Jonathan Greenblatt thug gets to be paraded around all the media. The ADL is always sourced by Congress and politicians and international and everything. And they have the credibility because they control the media and get to go around everywhere and with no opposing voice. Like the, the Barry Weiss thing that was just on uh, Mayor, uh, Bill Mayer, he is such a Zionist propagandist. He had Netanyahu on his show and was like, oh, I'll come work for you. I'll come do PR for you in Israel. I'll go get paid by the, the Jays. And then he goes, well, the other Jays, you know, <laughs> admitting and joking that HBO is ran by, you know, who yeah, we're talking and, about. Here. Yep, and they're, they're, all, they're allowed to joke about it, but uh, nobody else is. Nobody's allowed to say it seriously. And even like, even actual Jews who call them out for, you know, trying to uh, apologize for war crimes and things like that. They're accused of being traitors to their people when it's like, well, wouldn't you want uh, the best for your people? Wouldn't you want your people to be universally beloved around the world instead of have to uh, use this whole anti-Semitism trap in order to silence their opponents? I mean, wouldn't it be much better just for everybody to get along? I know that's a really naive way of looking at things, but yeah, just... if, if they don't want to be boycotted, stop what they're doing. Listen, listen to people's complaints. If you don't want to be hated, don't blame people and say they're hating you for no reason. Maybe have an honest conversation about what people are upset about and not just censor everybody. That, what, that's what they're trying to do and lie and smear about them with their ADL attack dogs. Yeah, one thing I found interesting about the boycott, divestment, sanctions, the comparison to apartheid, everything, Benny Gantz, the uh, blue and white candidate for um, prime minister, 
actually came out and said the other day, I wrote about it for RT, came out and said that uh, the uh, Palestinians living under occupation in the West Bank are the second, be the second uh, best off of all of the Arabs in the world. Uh, the best off being, of course, the ones that live in Israel under occupation. But yeah, that, that the Palestinians in the West Bank are the, the happiest ones in the world because they live in, on such great conditions. I mean, I know I would love to have soldiers sticking their guns in my face when I uh, walk out to go to work in the morning and, you know, people shooting my children when they try to come home from school. And that, that just sounds like a great way of life. I don't know about you. They just constantly put out propaganda that's pure inversion of the truth. It's almost like the... Kabbalah wizardry trick that they just go to every single time. I'm pretty sure you could go uh, interview a bunch of uh, Palestinians that are in Israel proper, I guess, as they call it, or Jerusalem or the West Bank or Gaza and ask them if they think they're doing better off than Arabs all over the, the Arab world. And I guarantee you that they just, they put out such, you know, propaganda all the time. I just watched uh, Abby Martin's new documentary about uh, free Gaza or, or something like that is what it's called. And it, it shows how there's this this girl, this young girl that was going to the, the uh, return protest at, at, the, at the fence and they, they shot her and killed her. And then they put out a video that she said she was a human shield. And then they cut off where she says, I go and I treat the wounded and she, she's the medic there and they still killed her. And then they cut it off. And even like this, this girl was murdered for just trying to save people that are so desperate that they're going out there and just risk getting shot. So the world will, li will listen to what's going on there. And then they're so good at blaming the victim, making the vic making themselves out to be the victims and like the Palestinians, the evil terrorists, when you look at the death tolls on each side, and there's no comparison at all, it's like 99.9% .9 all Palestinians are getting killed. Yo, yeah, it's Palestinians throwing rocks and Israelis fighting back with exploding bullets that if they don't kill you, will just maim you severely. And you're supposed to say, oh yeah, clashes. I mean, I think it was Lee Camp did a great expose of this on uh, RT where he just unpacked the, the passive voice and uh, just the fact that it's always, oh, Palestinians died and oh, there were clashes and there's never any sort of active verbs or any sort of subject uh, killing the Palestinians. They always just die and... Uh, I mean, and, and even when, when people try to show uh, films like Abby Martin's or like the, the Occupation of the American Mind, which is supposed to be shown on PBS, and then polled at the last minute because we can't have anybody, you know, accurately analyzing the propaganda that issues forth out of Israel. We just have to, I mean, what are you supposed to do when you're not even allowed to, to name the, I mean, I, I don't want to be melodramatic and say name the enemy, but I would say that I'm not going to say all the J words are all enemy because that's not the case at all. And not even everybody in Israel is the enemy because plenty of people like Americans who are extremely frustrated with their government are not able to do anything about their government. But the Zionist ruling class is very much the enemy. What are you supposed to do when you can't name the enemy? How do you talk about it? I was just going to bring up occupation of the American mind as well. I didn't realize that that was supposed to air and got blocked. Just like the Al Jazeera documentary, you know, straight undercover and they say, oh, it's an anti-Semitic film. And then now they're putting out all this propaganda. I see the Zionist on Twitter uh, saying, oh, Qatar runs Washington, D.C. Watch <laughs> out for the in D.C. of Qatar. And it's like, give me a break, guys. Come on. Yeah, they've got the right area of the world, but they're off by a few countries. Well, I mean, it's the same thing that Alex Jones does with the, oh, yeah, the uh, the Arabs run Wall Street or uh, China runs Hollywood. Yeah, sure, dude. Uh, you just keep telling yourself that. I mean, you've done you've done a great job breaking down Alex's whole propaganda thing in your videos. And I would recommend anybody who who has any sort of faith left in Alex Jones should go watch your videos and then they'll be quickly deprived of that. But, you know, truth wins out in the end. And uh, that, that's what I mean, though. It's like, how do people have to come up with some sort of code to talk about these things or just move on to other platforms that don't censor or what's the deal? Because as much as everybody is getting blocked from YouTube and uh, Twitter and Facebook and everything, they're doing it at such a slow pace that people aren't just like all getting fed up and leaving. So what I mean, I mean, what, does there have to be some sort of extinction level event that people all just pick up and move to BitChute or DLive or whatever or 
is there a code that we can come up with to talk about these things or because obviously this has to be talked about this is i would say the central problem this is what's driving all the wars this is um i mean if it wasn't for the greater israel project there would be nothing that our soldiers would be fighting for even uh, this general uh, richard clark who came out last year and said that oh american soldiers need to be ready to fight and die for israel well there was not any sort of outcry to that and i find that appalling well, you know, a lot of times the things that they don't want to let us talk about are what we need to talk about the most. So, yeah, it's a little bit of combination of of code. It's funny when when you talk about like saying code words, it's like they even take those code words and like say, "Oh, these are all anti-Semitic dog whistles," and it's still bad to them. Even they just can't be identified. They can't be spoken of. It's like uh, Harry Potter. What is it, Voldemort? Yeah, Voldemort. The, those who you should should not name, the unnameables. Uh, I mean, that should tell you all you need to know. Uh, I saw, I remember it was John Cusack, he shared that, uh, or he got hacked, and he shared oh, yeah, that. Oh, he said it was a bot. <laughs> using on the people. Yeah. And then it's, it you know, attributed to Voltaire that, you know, uh, what is it? Who you can't talk about is is who's in control or something like that. I always get it totally butchered. Yeah, it's, it's so, something you know. like a he. If you want to find out who is controlling you, find out who you're not allowed to criticize. I think is the quote. Right. And they they say it was Voltaire, but then they say it's actually some white nationalist guy. I mean, it sounds like something Voltaire would say, but of course, Wikipedia it sounds like it's the white true, nationalist and it's guy, so. was thought of a long time ago, and it's just common sense, and it's yeah. probably been repeated by a lot of people and always been true. Yep, and that's what they always try to do, is that if you come out with some, anything that's ever been said by anybody, and it's, it's always guilt by association is how it's done, because if you've if appeared in a picture with someone, I mean, they, they, I've heard of people getting their Facebook accounts removed from, because of appearing in pictures with, like, white nationalists or with even with InfoWars reporters, and it's like, I mean, I think that this is a thing that Jeffrey Epstein and, Je and Ghislaine Maxwell used to do is that they would just take pictures with people and then it's like they can just use that as blackmail because you don't even have to uh, get uh, lured into a bedroom with a little girl. You just uh, show up in a picture of Jeffrey Epstein and your career is over. Yeah, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't say just a picture makes your career over because, you know, they were they were embedded in the top levels of like social society in New York. The, the billionaires go to galas and take pictures with everybody. So I wouldn't say it's that bad. They definitely were the deeper levels of uh, control were through the blackmail, the sexual blackmail. You know, you said something at the beginning of, of the intro of the video about uh, how it's it's not all people in Israel and uh, how Netanyahu's Zionist election, it'll be him or the other evil guy. And I just saw an article about how a lot of Israeli elections are influenced by the Christian Zionists in America as well, which really? obvious with uh, Eggy and, and Kufi raising all the money and sending it over there. It's like a uh, international Zionist cabal with Christians, Freemasons, even uh, the Saudi Arabia and the Muslims that are that are all involved with this. So uh, I was going to say, oh yeah, the article. I was looking for the article, but I can't, couldn't find it. Did Did they say are they backing a particular candidate or Netanyahu? I assume, or are they just? Um, is, is yeah, it, Netanyahu. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm seeing on <laughs> on Twitter at APAC, CPAC, Fox News. They're all going Likud and Netanyahu. It's it's so clear that you know they they try to pretend like APEC represents uh, you know all Jews or all of Israel, but really it's like just a straight propaganda arm of the the ultra Zionist Likuds. Yeah, and it's like uh, like they said in the lobby. I mean, it's the the American uh, version where they're they're getting very concerned about the college students are uh, di disappearing in large en masse, and even in Israel itself, the young people are leaving. They're moving to Germany, of course, ironically enough, and uh, like the 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 fact is that the only people who are left to elect these people are the hardcore uh, ultra Zionist uh, Netanyahu backers, and so you have the country is just moving further and further to the right. And they're taking all of our technology with them. And that's the scary part because um, another thing that you hear the, the uh, lobbyists saying in that uh, documentary is that they're, they've got this program called Census that they're using to track uh, BDS activists and other undesirables. 
And that thing is basically the internet of things. That's people being tracked by their smart meters. And uh, I mean, my computer just uh, suddenly went dark over here for no reason with the, with the notes that I was gonna use to come up with uh, the uh, things I wanted to make sure to mention. And I don't think that's a coincidence at all. I've had my volume messed with Cue when doing- Twilight Zone music. Cue it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting how that works. And I mean, so what, what did you, have you looked into this, uh, these, uh, the census company at all? This, this uh, company that they talk about in the lobby? Um, is that the one, uh, I thought it was another name, but it, that it's the most advanced Israeli uh, software on the market and that they're working with the military and that yes. they're fully integrated everywhere online. And then when YouTube did their Vox Apocalypse, they put out a press release, they mentioned that we know we're going to delete a lot of people, but we know that, you know, private institutions and NGOs and, and research groups like the ADL and Israel and everybody are uh, profiling and, and categorizing and a the ADL is putting us all on dossiers and stuff like they've been known to do for decades. And then Israel and the Canary Mission, and they're all about putting everybody on list, profiling everybody. Mike Evans, the Friends of Zion uh, Christians, I don't even want to call him a Christian Zionist because he's kind of quasi not a Christian or totally not a Christian, but he's quasi Jewish. He's kind of semi Jewish. You know of him, right? Mike Evans? Yeah. yeah. Friends of Zion. He gives award, the Friends of Zion Museum in Jerusalem, he give a, a, gives awards to any political leader that moves their capital to Jerusalem. And he's got a whole like, internet division where they're putting out tons of uh, Hasbara propaganda and that he says every single anti-Semitic message we profile them we profile them so you know sometimes I get trolls online that say like oh you know they're uh, the Adam's working they're profiling all of his listeners it's like they obviously haven't been paying attention to what I've been covering and what's all out there they're tracking everywhere you go, everybody on YouTube, on every website, on your phone, everywhere. And it's incredibly dangerous. Whitney Webb just did a talk with True News about how this company Carbine that's connected to Ehud Barak, Chertoff, and I think Epstein, all these ultra Zionists, all these people in these networks, Palantiered, uh, Peter Thiel, they're doing all of these pre-crime and tracking stuff. And, and it's just, it's so incredibly dangerous and it's all controlled in Israel. And this is how they're going to really be able to enforce this, uh, this uh, biblical, technological, prophetic, dystopian world they're trying to build. Yeah. And I would recommend anybody who hasn't read it yet should read uh, Whitney Webb's piece about the, her, her latest, I guess, part four in the Epstein series, because Carbine 911 is a really, really scary dystopian uh, invention. I mean, basically, it turns your phone into a surveillance device. It's actually a lot like this NSO group's spyware Pegasus, which um, is a malware that hijacks your phone's camera, hijacks your microphone, and basically slurps up all the data from your phone. All you have to do is click a link. I think there are some versions where you don't even have to click a link. All they do is call you, and even if you don't pick up the call, your phone is now a surveillance device. Congratulations. And, nine one, and uh, Carbine 911 is, takes that technology and claims to be using it for emergencies. Oh, we're going to stop mass shootings with this stuff. And, yeah, and, and Trump's you, calling for it. Trump's saying, oh, we need yep. to stop shooters before they act and red flag laws and, and anti-Semites are crazy. It's like you can see where the, the narrative they're building towards. Yep. And uh, he's on board with this HARPA thing too, the Health Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is, I mean, just the name should be the signal of how uh, disturbing this thing is. But yeah, they want to use your uh, your Amazon Echo, your Fitbit, your all your personal tracking devices to build a profile of you. And then if you snap and do something, oops, well, everybody else who did any of those things that you did before then now is going to be either picked up or questioned or surveilled or any of these other things. I mean, I shouldn't even say surveil because we're all under surveillance already, as you mentioned. I think the people who are trolling you and trying to say that they're profiling your listeners just don't want people to listen to your content because I know yeah. I've learned a lot about, about uh, just the Zionist uh, control grid from watching your videos and I think a lot of other people have too. Um, so yeah, and D David Icke's, uh, the, the interview with uh, David Icke when he finally pointed out uh, that what he's been building up to all of these years that Israel and what he refers to as the Sabbatean Frankis, which I haven't really heard of that term used a lot, but um, that these are the people behind 9-11 and these are the people behind all the wars. You think there's a reason why he waited so long to get to that point as far as his work? Because 
before, I think a lot of people didn't take him seriously because he was talking about reptiles and whatnot, but um, now he's he's turned down the reptiles and turned up the, uh, let's get serious here. I mean, I don't know. Well, um, I've seen Ike do videos when he looked way younger, you know, um, at least a decade ago where he was talking about Rothschild Zionism and a lot of this stuff. And, uh, you know, I think he's just kind of seen it all unfold like we are, you know, in his book, he talks, he, he covers so many topics. It's almost, it, it almost made me think he was watching my YouTube channel every day. And, and, you know, he quoted a, a source from Bolin's book, a whole lot on a lot of the most important information on who was behind nine 11. So really he's just, uh, you know, he's just seen where things are going, I guess. And, uh, definitely in the book, he's talking a lot about, a lot of the most important issues and uh he's one of the most hope, high profile people that i've seen cover it so you gotta applaud the guy for uh you know putting his neck out on the line to speak the truth i definitely think he's gonna raise awareness and open up people's interests into these issues like sabatine uh, frankism which uh i've covered in the past i've done videos on that and had guests on uh, christopher john bjorkness talks a lot about that uh robert zeffert of atlantean gardens has a has a book about that and it's incredibly interesting stuff with their like it, basically they were moshiachs uh zabatai zevi and uh, jacob frank they were just their moshiachs of the past and they kind of now in modern day we have like chabad and the rebbe and noah hide laws and seems like that's the modern incarnation of it all. Yeah, I mean, do you see Noahide laws coming into this country in force through things like Christian Zionism, or do you think they're going to try to bring it through other directions, or is they going to hit mo multiple ways at once? Because I know that, that stuff is pretty ominous, and I don't think that enough people know about it. I mean, if they've been watching your channel, they know about it, but in general, it's not a thing that's talked about a lot, and uh, I find it pretty disturbing. They're definitely trying to do it with uh, Christian Zionism, with uh, guys like Rabbi uh, Hagee, the Kabbalah wizard, Rabbi Hagee. And, uh, you know, right now they're pushing the Judeo-Christian a whole lot. They eventually, you know, they're, this is a long-term plan. This could take a few decades, but they want to get rid of Christianity and convert all Christians to not just worship Jesus, but worship all Jews as all the chosen people and help them do everything they need, worship them as the nation of priests, help them build their temple, uh, let the rule the earth with their king of Israel, the, the Moshiach and the Sanhedrin. And it's just really they want to follow their prophecies, you know, to the T is, is what's happening. The simplest way to put it. Yeah, and as for enforcement of that goes, I mean, shifting gears a little bit, you see um, American uh, police departments getting sent over to uh, Israel and Palestine to train, basically, to learn how to oppress uh, native populations. And then they come back here and they start shooting people and wonder, how did this possibly happen? You think people have a deliberate blindness to, as far as what's going on in Israel, maybe they don't want to touch it because it's the third rail of political discourse. And they don't realize that what happens over there is bound to come back here and by them in the ass at some point or is it just uh an ignorance or they they think that oh well of course they have to learn how to fight criminals and we've all been told that all palestinians are terrorists even the babies you know if the fetus is a is a dead deadly terrorist uh i mean what, what do you think about uh, that yeah that's what their uh, political leader over there said they she called them all snakes yeah um it, I just I don't know if the masses are ever going to get it unless the mass media starts to cover it a little bit. And I just I don't see it heading in that direction. I see it going in the other way. They're cracking down even more and allowing even less criticism. If you look at even mainstream news a few decades ago, they would say way more hardcore stuff. And uh, you go back hundreds of years throughout history, the way people would write and talk about these issues, they were they, they weren't scared to talk about it like they are now. And with the media, you know, to think about YouTube started, I think, in 2000, uh, what was it, 2005. Yeah, 2005. It's so young that we've been able to have, like, freedom and, and share this kind of information. And then they're, they're cracking down on it so hard. They allowed these monopolies to have free speech, you know, more so to get everybody on. And then now they're going to squash any competition. And uh, 
is, you know, bit shoot. People, everybody needs to move to a bit shoot. And, but even them, I don't totally trust, you know, who knows if they're not controlled by the same people and just pretending to be opposition or something, or if they'll get bought out or, or what'll happen. I don't know if YouTube was just fair. If we had YouTube fair algorithms, like they passed a law or something that the algorithms have to be open source and other, any third party can look at it and, and, you know, it all has to be fair, no discrimination. That would change everything right there. Yeah, they're actually trying to do something sort of like that in Australia, of all places, which you'd think would be strange because they've got some really harsh censorship laws that they adopted in the wake of the Christchurch shooting. But they did have this uh, big, at least this uh, extremely long, like 600 something pages list of recommendations that they made to the big tech companies that uh, the algorithms have to be auditable by a special committee. Of course, it's all, it's anybody's guess whether the special committee will just say, oh yeah, sure, it's totally unfair, it uh, deplatforms anybody with controversial opinions. Okay, yeah, that's cool, as long as it doesn't, you know, make a, other arbitrary distinctions. So I don't know if anything's going to come of that, but I thought that was interesting because I agree, if there was somebody would force uh, YouTube and Google and Facebook and everybody to uh, actually only, you know, deplatform people who are actively calling for violence or threatening people or uh, live streaming acts of violence or whatever. I mean, you would think that they have their hands full dealing with that and they don't need to start cracking down on political speech because to me, it seems like they're asking for something uh, violent to happen in real life because people who are making comments online, it's a pressure release valve. You're allowed to say, get, get whatever it is off your chest and maybe you don't go out into the local Walmart and start shooting or whatever these people plan on doing. Um, it, not that there's any connection between political speech and extremist acts. I don't actually think there is. I think that that is entirely played up by the FBI and other people who want to uh, silence criticism of the political system. But uh, I think in general, like if you want people to get along better, it helps to let them uh, blow off steam. Absolutely, yeah. Um, the after one of the synagogue shootings, the ambassador of Israel went to the UN and he called for the criminalization in, of uh, anti-Semitism. And he said, the time for talk is over. We just need to you know, throw you in jail basically or fine you if you say anything that uh, you, know, you oppose us in any way. You object to being enslaved and uh, taken over, conquered, you know? Yeah, I remember that. And then Trump came out and saying, yeah, execute them all. And it wasn't clear whether he was talking about like people who go out and shoot people, which, okay, that's one thing, but execute all the anti-Semites. Okay, well, uh, which definition of anti-Semites are we talking about here? And uh, no, that's not a thing. Um, because well, the death penalty for hate crimes and uh, oh, that's murder. Right, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, hate crimes. I mean, that, that's the, the big one of the biggest scams there is. I don't know. Are you familiar with uh, Laird Wilcox's book about uh, fake hate crimes? Basically chronicled, and this wasn't even, this, this doesn't even take it up to like, I think the, it go, only goes up to the 1990s or something, but he basically like broke down all these fake hate crimes and talked about the ADL uh, infiltrating the FBI and stealing records and stuff. And, and nothing really came of that. And no, isn't it surprising how like, you know, they, they were just spying on everybody and secretly surveilling law enforcement and everything and nobody seemed to care it's wh where did that story go I mean it's just shocking that all of this is in this agency's past and agency that agency organization I guess the ADL isn't technically an agency it might as well be but um yeah it's an how, agency how of, of Israel the, the fact that they're in charge of regulating speech in Silicon Valley with their AI lab is they should be nowhere near that. How and how are we supposed to expose them when they're the ones that are in charge of creating the algorithms? Jonathan Greenblatt, literally, you've seen the clip probably, says, yeah, we work with Google and YouTube that when somebody searches for, you know, some conspiratorial anti-Semitic topic, we redirect them to Yad Vashem, to our propaganda. I mean, and this, and then he goes, and this is caring about free speech or something like that. It's like, whoa, what, yeah. how have we allowed these people? I, I, ha I have a video actually, who put them in charge of free <laughs> speech? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really scary. I'm sure you've seen the, um, the, the video of the ADL uh, co collaborating with, I think you see Berkeley to do this, um, the, basically this pre-hate. They want to get hate before it uh, is hate, before it uh, makes it out into the internet. So they've collaborated to do this AI thing where they're gonna 
go through all the comment sections and if you're starting to post a comment that they don't think maybe is going to turn out that well they're going to stop you they're going to stop it before it even gets out so they don't even have to do the censoring it's just this ai uh, thought control thing and i mean the more words that we're not allowed to say because they're uh, written off as anti-semitic dog whistles I mean, you can want to control what how people think. You can control the words they use, and that's basically mm -hmm. how it's done. Yeah, they're always using linguistic uh, sorcery to try to brainwash people. Certainly. Yeah, I did a whole video did about you, how did you see the Barry Weiss on uh, on Bill Maher. No, I haven't seen that one yet. I saw her on <laughs> Joe Rogan's show, and I saw her on The View, but I didn't see her on Bill Maher. The, the way that they just like this girl and this this ex Zionist extremist uh, apologist, they just she's the one that gets paraded on on all these shows. I've never seen her have to, uh, you know, the same shows have somebody else that really has the other side get this much of publicity. And I've never seen um, I've never seen her debate anybody on this stuff. But the, the line I, I see it on Twitter right now, real time from Bill Mayer, it says, quote, Anti-Semitism is the ultimate conspiracy, and when anti-Semitism thrives, it's a sign that society has replaced truth with lies. Wow, that's a really Orwellian way of looking at it, especially when you consider how she defines anti-Semitism. I mean, what I don't understand is why are there not more like organized groups of Jews speaking out against this? Because if, I mean, why, why would you want to be associated with a psychopathic uh, Zionist government if you're just an ordinary Jewish person? Like, it seems to me that that would be extremely insulting to uh, have my ethnic group smeared as like being, it's- uh, You know who I see, you know who's out there is Code Pink. And uh, there, there's two women that I see on Twitter all the time. And whenever something happens, I see them like, not actually going after the Zionists real hard. They always kind of like segue it to white men. So it's it's almost like they're the the. It, do you see that too? I, I don't. I see yeah, it. I haven't really noticed. Also. I've I've seen I've seen other people do that. I haven't really seen Code Pink, but I I don't really I don't think I follow. I might I might follow Medea Benjamin, but I don't. Uh, yeah, I that, mean yeah. it's. It is a definitely a troubling tendency. I've seen that with other people. I've seen that with uh, Black Agenda Report does that a lot. They accuse white supremacy of all the world's crimes, and it's like, well, not quite. I mean, white supremacy has done some stuff, but uh, like, it's not like the I saw that one of the girls, not Medea Benjamin, the other one, I, I can't remember her name, but I saw her on Twitter. She, somebody responded to her and said, you know, there's all Zionist around Trump. And then she said, block this anti-Semite. Wow. The, is who is the anti-war, anti-right wing could, leading? Ban this anti-Semite for saying there's Zionists around Trump. I'm not kidding. Wow. I saw that. Yeah, is... th th and that's one of the problems is that you, if you say the sky is blue, they say ban this anti-Semite. It's like you can't call out the most obvious things in the world. Like the, saying there's Zionists around Trump is like the least controversial thing. I mean, you're not even saying there's warmongering Zionists or there's psychotic Zionists. You're just saying there's Zionists. And, and again, it's like, okay, well, aren't, isn't she then the one that's assuming that Zionist is a bad thing? I mean, like, if, if she's mm -hmm. gonna, if she's gonna act from her own, uh, from her own standards there, then, then she should be the one who's banned for assuming that Zionist is a bad thing. Of course, I would agree that it is, but um, it's- They do that all the time. So, so this idea though, Barry Weiss is saying that uh, anti-Semitism is just because there's anti-Semitism in America because society has replaced truth with lies. That's like saying we're right because we're right almost. Yep. And it's like, it's nothing we're doing. We could never do anything wrong. That there would never be any conspiracy and no Jewish person has ever committed any crimes or any corruption or anything like that. It's your fault. Your society is awful. You're just blaming it on us. It's blaming it's a non it's a non argument and i i don't know i got to do a video i've done videos on her in the past she drives me nuts i just see her just being propped up like this you know such oh, yeah. a propaganda no and she and she's she can't she can't argue her points at all if anybody even remotely challenges her i mean that's what i found so fascinating about her appearance on the joe rogan show is that all he did was ask her like what is what is uh, tulsi's thing with Assad? and she was completely unable to 
say anything because she's been propped up her whole life. She's one of these people who's been let, uh, born with a silver spoon up her ass, pardon the vulgarity, but just like, it's just to uh, this privilege, talk about privilege. I mean, this is uh, the, the epitome of privilege is Barry Weiss. Mm -hmm. It's a book really deal. makes you like wonder seven. about, oh, and I'll talk about privilege. And she wrote a whole article about uh, the Women's March and how the, 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 they don't like, some of them don't like the Zionist and that, you know, she's got some complaints all about that. But oh, the, just the fact that she got booked on Joe Rogan, like when nobody even really knew she, who she was, it kind of makes you wonder, like, how did that happen? What, what's the deal behind that? Well, yeah, I mean, the, how did she get a, a gig writing for the New York Times op-ed page when nobody knew who she was? How did she get, I mean, didn't she get like a book deal when she was 17 years old or something? It's like, who the, the, the book I think it's through New York, oh, she works at New York Times and she just got some huge book deal. And you know, it was right after the synagogue shooting and she actually went to that synagogue in Pittsburgh. Oh, wow. <laughs> So small world, not coincidence, yes, maybe. Very yeah. small world. Uh, that's that's a little suspicious, but um, yeah, no, she she's just uh, there's too many too many dodgy things about this person. It, when when they when they're propped up like that so heavily and and just shoved down your throat at every at every turn when they have absolutely nothing to say, it's uh, you really wonder because and then, and then she and she tries to frame herself as a champion of uh, free speech. She's always talking about like uh, speech codes on campuses and stuff and how that's a terrible thing, except when it's protecting Zionists because you know they're special and uh, we can't say anything bad about that. So, I mean, <laughs> yep. She's uh, and, and Bill Mayer. He's he's. I've got seen so many clips of him doing his propaganda too. It's just all too obvious. Well, and yeah, then on Netflix, you know, HBO, Netflix is just it's, at, almost every week they've got a new Zionist propaganda show coming out. Yeah, and these are these people are presented as like edgy or alternative or something. And that's and, and again, I mean, not to hammer on the Barry Weiss thing, but this intellectual dark web concept, which I think she right. came up with, if anything. Um, but this idea that these intellectuals are so edgy and super like out there and yet they're all Zionists, but um, we, you know, they're, they're the, the limits of what's acceptable discourse is Jordan Peterson, who is like the most, I don't know, there's, there's not a whole lot there. He talks fast and he uh, uses fancy terms, but uh, he doesn't have a whole lot of- The substance. propensity, rightfully so. There was an article recently, I, it was by a, a Jewish journalist, and she said, um, she talked about the, the dark, intellectual dark web, and she goes, these are like the alternative people that are, that are acceptable. And it was like Ben Shapiro, Sam Harris, uh, Rubin, uh, Weinstein, I think Eric Weinstein, and like, it's, it's every single one, basically. Uh, Peterson was in there as well. Yeah, and Ben Shapiro is another one. Know. Talk about Schultz and Eason. <laughs> yeah, Ben Shapiro is another one. Talks really fast, but has absolutely nothing to say. I mean, uh, he's one of the most annoying people on the planet, and yet he has millions of viewers. Again, because he was propped up, uh, brought up from a young age to be this like intellectual superstar with without the intellect. He was just like Barry Weiss. Yep. They are. They they should be together. They're a perfect really couple, should. I think. Barry Weiss and Ben Shapiro. Oh God! Imagine how horrifying their children would come out. I mean, we're talking like. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll have both the like, the like complete obtuseness of Barry Weiss, completely uh, incapable of realizing their total privilege, and just the bloodthirstiness of Ben Shapiro saying that, that Arabs like to bomb things and live in sewage. And it's like, really, you don't think that maybe somebody did that to them? You know, you don't think maybe maybe they didn't choose to live that way. I mean, just the the sheer complete like un, un, lack of empathy. It's yeah. a psychopathic lack of empathy. Yeah. And it's unfortunately, it filters all the way up through the people in the Trump administration, people, people like Kushner, who he goes to Palestine and claims he's trying to make peace. And he's like, I can't deal with these Palestinian officials. They're, they're hysterical. They're crazy. They're, uh, you don't think that maybe they, they're reacting to like 50 years of oppression uh, by people just like you, dude? Uh, it seems to me that would be natural. Sociopaths is when you don't uh, understand others others feelings they can't put themselves in other people's shoes and um th yeah this the whole peace deal i did a video the other day called the pal or the zionist peace problem 
and it just it it shows they try to act like oh the palestinians don't want to come to the table or that we offered them all these deals they always decline and they just they just attack us it's like the deals were all screw jobs you would have never took those deals if you were in their shoes and uh the idea that kushner and avi berkowitz and uh friedman and Trump and all these people are going to be honest brokers and, and, and have any kind of fair peace. Pence literally says, I, I don't want to be an honest broker. We're on the side of Israel. Uh, Trump yeah. tweeted back in like 2011 that if the UN gives statehood to the Palestinians, that we should defund them and leave the UN. And this is who's going to make this greatest deal of the century, Mr. Mr. Kushner, a Chabad supremacist. Oh, I didn't see that particular tweet. But yeah, I wrote an article, um, I think last year about how Trump's peace plan is the deletion of Palestine, because that's basically what it is. They want to just section it up and give give the pieces to Israel to give the, the primest uh, slabs to Israel. And then give everything else to what Saudi Arabia gets the holy sites, uh, you know, every, everybody benefits yeah. except for the Palestinians who get screwed once again. And uh, yeah, I watched the I watched that video you did about the Zionist peace problem, and that it basically it's it's true. The Israelis have torpedoed the peace process every single time because they do not want them to have a state because they will right. be outnumbered. Well, there's yep. no way of getting around that problem. It, it's it's Netanyahu's peace plan, if anything, not not Kushner's. And really, it's probably you know Rothschild and whoever you know top level people they're associated with. But and, and now we're seeing it, Netanyahu. Every day now we're seeing, oh, yeah, he's going to take – I just saw not just that he's going to do the Jordan Valley, what he announced a few days ago. Now he says we're going to get even more sites too. And then the total lack of self-awareness. I saw an article where the, where the um, Israelis were saying, well, we have to annex this. We can't allow one of our settlements to be surrounded by the enemy. <laughs> It's, yeah, the lack of self-awareness is just stunning. I mean, these are people, it, I guess, I mean, yeah, brainwashing. It's the same thing that uh, American exceptionalism, the people who grow up here and think, of course, we can just go over there and bomb everybody. And, and it's terrifying when uh, somebody strikes back. How dare they? Don't these people know their place? I mean, we run the world. And Israel has that in a different way. It's just that they're a much smaller country and they uh, are committing much more uh, immediate human rights violations because the people are living on their land that they're killing. With, with America, at least they have the decency to do it halfway around the world. I um, mean, not saying that that's necessarily better, but it's like uh, that. That's I think that one of the reasons that, that I, I did a video about this a while ago. But one one of the things that America gets out of the relationship is that Israel's policies make them look sane. I don't know. It's hard to make us look sane. You know, I just wonder what American foreign policy would look like if we weren't hijacked by Zionism. It, it would be a, a lot different if we just had, uh, you know, it, to even blame, like, obviously you don't blame all Americans for what it does, but to, to blame even our, can we blame our government for being hijacked, for being taken over, for being openly bought out while they're talking about Russian collusion and we're just... Remember it came out recently that Israel was busted for like interfering in elections all over the world. Yep. And that yeah. was like buried, not even a big story, barely covered anywhere. And then we're just going to go into the election and acting like that wasn't going on, acting like the Al Jazeera lobby stuff wasn't going on, acting like all of it's not happening. It's going to be nuts. Yeah, I wrote about that for uh, RT and I had to I had to find that story and dredge it up from nothing because nobody else was covering it. And I'm like, uh, how can we not cover this? This is really important. But yeah, they were they had their fingers in so, so many little pies, at least several countries in Africa, a bunch of countries in Southeast Asia. And those were only the ones we knew about. Those were the only the ones they didn't take the time to cover up because they were third world countries that maybe didn't have such a rigorous election process. And what uh, worries me is that you had a meeting, uh, I think, maybe a couple of weeks ago of all the big tech people, uh, security uh, personnel from the big tech companies and uh, the Department of Homeland Security, FBI, uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, all talking about how we can secure the elections for this year going forward. So, you know, I mean, not that elections really change much, but uh, it, it just is adding insult to injury that they're really going to make sure that even the controlled opposition doesn't get in this time. Because I think Trump was very much a pressure release valve for a certain part of the population that was had really had it up to here with uh, eight years of Obama 
and they wanted their guy in office, even though Trump has not followed through on any of his important promises. He's, he's followed through on a few minor ones, but as far as getting the country out of all the wars, which I think is why most people voted for him, no, not happening. Never will. Yeah, Microsoft is working with DARPA and their their research R&D centers in Israel to create election guard for safe elections, not just in America. And these are already in place in America and elsewhere, but they want to have these be all around the world. And, um, and yeah, Israel is interfering in lots of countries because they have to win over leaders. Uh, they they want to they want to uh, influence the influencers, the, the Christian Zionists, to get everybody to gradually become Noahides or extreme Christian Zionists that are worshiping Israel and helping them with all of their end times prophecies, just like our anti-Semitisms are funded by Sheldon Adelson, is uh, not just trying to control anti-Semitism in America, but they have European bills and all this legislation saying that we're going to police the world for anti-Semitism and enforce these definition everywhere. Netanyahu and the Zionists want to install leaders everywhere that are going to be subservient to them, that are going to move the capital and recognize Jerusalem as the uh, eternal capital of the whole world. They're talking about moving the Hague now to uh, Jerusalem because that's prophecy that the law must come forth from Zion. And they just want to get leaders that are going to be go down and sign the thing under the little underground synagogue and, and go along with this whole 70 nations, end time, Zionist, uh, new world order. Yeah, touch the orb, touch the orb. Touch the and orb, you, yeah. You can't get much more sinister than that. It's like, oh yeah, let's all put our hands on a big glowing orb. But don't say that we're like secretly conspiring to control the world because that's really, uh, you know, we just touch orbs normally. That's, that's a totally normal thing for human beings to do. No, dude, sorry. It's it's yeah it's a little ridiculous and, and and before the he did that with the Saudi king before that he was saying you know the Saudis did 9/11 basically and I'm going to tell you who really did it and he was all hard against Muslims and the Saudis he goes and visits bows down gets the necklace and, uh, and Alex Jones before the election was like F the Saudis and the Saudis did 9/11 and they run Hollywood and everything like this and then now Trump does that and it's just like oh that's that's no big deal. And the Saudi king when 9-11 thought that Mossad did 9-11 also. So, you yeah, know, right. throw that Alan wrench in there also. And the orb picture takes on new meanings. Yeah, I read that recently. And they, they, they finally released one little morsel uh, to the 9-11 victims' families that are trying to sue Saudi Arabia for basically being part of 9-11. Oh, yeah, sure, we'll declassify this one name for you. And uh, you should be happy about that because uh, we're not going to declassify it for everyone. We'll just show you guys and you can't tell anybody about it. It's like, seriously, they're supposed to be happy with that? I mean, it's, it's a little ridiculous. And they try to say that, oh, conspiracy theorists are dangerous extremists and you should never associate with them. Well, more than half the population believes the government is covering something up about 9-11. And that's, mm -hmm. I would say that's a conservative estimate because a lot of people won't come forth and say that to a pollster. I don't remember who exactly did that poll, but this idea that uh, nobody actually believes these wacky, loony conspiracy theories is like, actually, yeah, actually, if you are in a room with 10 people, five of them probably do. At the same time, they're so fringe and they're so crazy, but at the same time, lots of people believe them and they're a huge threat and a huge danger. You know, just the, the double speak is uh, incredible. There's a headline out, I think today, wait, maybe that's, no, I can't tell if this article's today or if that's just saying today's date, but Wall Street Journal, Rupert Murdoch, Trump administration asked to delay release of 9-11 related documents. Victims' families want the information as part of their lawsuit against Saudi Arabia, and Trump asked to delay the release. How's that, Mr. Alex Jones, who put out like over 10 videos saying, Trump's going to expose 9-11. Come on on the show. Let's talk about the celebrating uh, Palestinians and Arabs and not a word about the dancing Israelis. When we get the photos out, not a word about the photos of them celebrating in front of the towers and were there before the towers were even hit. Ooh, yep. It just gets under my skin. I hate to bring up Alex Jones all the time. But no, but just... it's it's important because he has such a huge following. And if he were to actually have some integrity or grow a spine and actually like speak truth about these things, he could wake up a lot of people, but he chooses not to because, I don't know, his, uh, I, I don't know if, if he has just ideological fealty to this or if he's just in love with the money or whatever the deal is. 
um, I guess it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunate though, because like I said, he could wake up a lot of people and instead he chooses to lead them astray into the same like uber Zionist. Although I noticed that even Breitbart is like, I forget what article it was, but there was some like super Zionist thing. And the comments were all like, oh, these people are scum, these people are scum. And it's like, okay, interesting. So even Breitbart readers think that these Zionist psychopaths are scum. That, that was interesting because usually that's not the case. Comments on Breitbart? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I forget. I forget I, what the actual article was, but it was something about like some something that Israel had done that was really inexcusable. But Breitbart was trying to spin it as being like a good thing, and uh, the commenters did not agree. So I found that unusual. I'm hoping it's a sign of things to come the, because I the feel rare like, time. The rare time recently that I saw a Breitbart article comments, they were like the worst I've ever seen in my life. I was no, just man. like, oh my god, it, it's motivating, you know. Like, uh, sometimes I think, okay, everybody knows Jones is discredited. I shouldn't waste my time on him. But, you know, just the other day, I saw a sticker up at the taco shop in the drive through InfoWars, and I'm like, oh, there's somebody <laughs> else out there getting, getting duped. I see all these people duped in the comments by Breitbart, I, and it's just like, those are the, the low-hanging fruit. If you can, if you can get, uh, not Breitbart, but if you can get the InfoWars people at least, like, you know, you're going to win them over probably before, you know, some other people on the political spectrum. Yeah. And I mean, there will always be more people out there who are desperately in search of the truth and they're willing to look beyond their, uh, their immediate bubble. But not everybody has fallen into this echo chamber uh, way of looking at things that these social media things have tried to push on us. I mean, it's the YouTube's thing about, oh, we're a platform for free, free speech, but we're going to deplatform all these people. And uh, if you don't break the rules, but you look like you're about to break the rules, we'll take you off. But we're a platform for free speech. It's, it's such a... She a said that thing. on the day. Uh, yeah. Susan Wojcik, or do you know how to pronounce the name? I, I think it's Wojcicki, but I'm not sure about Wojcicki. that. Wojcicki. Yeah, the same day that she was like, got rid of James Alsup and some other YouTubers, you know, one of the waves of the purges. She put out a, a post saying like, you know, we let anything go or something like that. Or this is a time more than ever where free speech is important. You know, paraphrasing. Yeah. Everybody, her, she got ratioed so ridiculous, <laughs> which I see happening all the time. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why Twitter is going to hide uh, likes or hide retweets. They keep threatening to do that. I know Facebook, or, or rather Instagram, I think is experimenting with hiding likes, and Facebook is now starting to do the same. Twitter said it was going to do that a while ago. They haven't actually gone out and done that, but um, that's one of the reasons why they're going to do that. Because How authoritarian is that? That's like a, a sci-fi script that like how they limited state videos. It's like, oh, this is borderline. It doesn't break any rules, but it, we say it's borderline. So we don't want anybody to know how many other people are watching this. Yeah, we don't, we don't want you to know what other people think about this thing. We don't want you to know that there might be people that agree with you because your thoughts right. are dangerous. Right. It's, right. it's really, really scary. And uh, the fact that, the, that, the, that these are the only acceptable ways for people to communicate. I mean, you get off Facebook and all of a sudden it's like, well, wait, why, is, you know, why, why am I not communicating with everybody? People are suddenly communicate through Facebook. Oh, it's easy. Oh, okay, well, yeah, great. It's also easy to be a vegetable blob who never gets off your couch. But like, it, what kind of a life is that? I mean, it, I, I find that people's reliance on Facebook, once they get on, they tend not to get off and uh, unless they're kicked off in which case their world is over and it's like i don't know i left voluntarily i, I was tired of having my posts I, I had like a thousand something people on my friends list and then i make a post and five people see it well, what, the, what is the point of that what why right yeah i've basically abandoned facebook too i just the, the bare minimum like posting my videos on there maybe a reshare if it's like something i want to save to cover in a video or research but it's it, it, it definitely had a heyday and now it's just like almost going MySpace. Twitter is definitely uh, a lot a lot better or at least more popular right now, I'd say. But if you look at the numbers, especially worldwide, Facebook is way bigger than Twitter. Yeah, and I just wonder how many of those are really active users though, because a lot of them they say are fake. They delete billions of fake uh, accounts every year. So it's mm -hmm. like, how many of those are just fake accounts that didn't get caught? I mean, I know I've made fake, fake accounts on Facebook before. It's not that hard to do. And, uh, and a, lot, a lot of people it, make them it, automated. It, with, with fake accounts, it really sucks because like, it, we're in an information war and obviously covering the info we cover, like we are gonna be the primary targets for Hasbara, disinfo, 
and literal like sock puppet trolls and unit 8200 people messing with this. So when I'm looking at the comments, you know, I have to try to think, is this person real? Is this comment a legitimate person? Or is this part of some, you know, uh, bot swarm that's just trying to, you know, push this agenda? So it, it really makes it tough. Yeah, on Twitter, it's easy because you can see how many uh, followers they have and how many. And, and if they, a lot of times when like Ilhan Omar would make a post about APAC or something and there would be all these people who had like nine people they were following and zero people following them back. And I'd just be like, huh, so you just created this account today and you're posting from Tel Aviv. And I would just like post that uh, on their things and never, yeah. never heard back. Hey, and, and something else, I've seen like people that, I, that I'm, I'm pretty sure they're just crazy, maybe on drugs. They're, they're not, I don't think they're any kind of intel. And they'll have multiple accounts and just like spam over and over and pretend to be multiple people. It's just the, basically I'll just leave it at, don't trust anything you read in the comments because <laughs> there is so much psyops going on there. That's for sure. All right, well, let's leave it at that, I guess. And uh, so people, if they want to see more of your work, they can go to your nomorenews.net. Is that your website? Nomorenews.org with a K N O W. No. And uh, no more news on YouTube and BitChute and uh, what what do you want Twitter again? No more news one. Or uh, yeah, all the links you could easily find just at no more news dot org. All right, cool. And uh, everybody knows where to find me: Helen of Destroy dot com, uh, Velocirapture twenty three on Twitter, and uh, Velocirapture on Minds and Gab. Although I don't go on those as much as I should. I say people should go on alternative platforms and I don't do it myself. I'm a terrible person. Oh, well, anyway. Well, nobody's there. It, <laughs> yeah. It's weird. You have to have a critical critical mass like move yeah. somewhere. And I swear they just boost up people like Facebook and, and Twitter. Like, I don't know if it's organic, you know, it's DARPA. They're the chosen ones. These companies like Amazon for like a decade, they'll lose millions of dollars every year, but money just keeps being pumped in. It's like they're being artificially bolstered up to be quasi-government monopolies. Yeah, Google's losing money on the, well, YouTube rather is losing money as a segment of Google because of this censorship thing. But there's two tiers of stockholders. I heard this from the Google whistleblower himself, uh, Zach Voorhees. He said there's two tiers of stockholders. The voting ones are the ones who control everything and the ones who are losing money, they don't get a say in anything. So <laughs> that's that. I mean, when you have it set up like that, you can do whatever you want. All right. Amazing. Well, who, okay, who do you think is gonna win the Israeli election before we start? Netanyahu. Yeah, unfortunately, you're probably right. When are we gonna know? Do, do we find out today? They count, they don't have a uh, election guard there. They have paper ballots there, of course, of course. you know? Yeah. Just like yeah. they don't have body scanners in the airport there or, either. Or 5G for the- uh, I've heard that. Yeah, it's being created there with Qualcomm, which uh, Erwin Jacobs basically considers himself an Israeli and it, almost an Israeli company like Intel, essentially. Yep, so what's good for the goose is not good for the gander, but um, yeah, mm -hmm. we'll see soon enough. All right. Have a good afternoon, everybody. All right. Good to be here, Helen. Thanks. Bye-bye.